This is a great time of year. I love Christmas. And one of the things I love so much about Christmas, as I'm sure many of you do, are the many different movies that, that we watch only at Christmas season. Um, because they're surrounded around the theme and the idea of Christmas. Um, there's some great movies and there's some really stupid movies and there's some really weird movies. And so there's all sorts of different kinds of movies that I don't know if your family is like mine, but like just annually you have to watch these movies over and over again every year. There's several movies that we have to watch and I'm sure that's the way that, that you have as well. But one of the unique themes that you see in some of these Christmas movies that's, that you, you find it in several of them is that is that in these movies, in these stories, a really insignificant and small character can make a huge difference. The most unlikely characters that you wouldn't expect turn everything within the story and give the Christmas hope and finish the story because of some action or some influence that they have in the movie. I think about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He was a strange cat. He was a deer, actually had a red nose, and he was an outcast from the other reindeer. They wouldn't even let him play in the reindeer games that they had until that one foggy Christmas Eve where Rudolph saved Christmas. And because of that peculiar bright light, that unlikely character allowed little boys and little girls across this world to have presents that night because he guided that sleigh through the fogginess of that Christmas Eve. There's other characters, think of Tiny Tim, who that, that little ill boy changed the heart of that mean dude, Scrooge. I think of Cindy Lou Who from Whoville in the story of the Grinch who stole Christmas. That little girl absolutely changed his heart. Then, how, how can we go without mentioning Kevin McAllister from Home Alone, that punk kid who brought his family together through that whole thing? There's just so many other stories like that where insignificant, unlikely characters make a major impact. Well, as we look and as we hone in on the, the real, true Christmas story, wouldn't you believe it that we find some really unlikely characters that God decides to bring the greatest gift, the most anticipated moment in human history to this part, he decides to bring this gift through some really peculiar, unlikely people. People that didn't have a lot of influence, people that weren't a big deal, people that you wouldn't have thought God would do something that he wants this whole world to know about, that God would use these unlikely characters. And through these characters, show us some really important things about the gift that he brings in Jesus. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of these unlikely characters through the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, look at them really closely and learn a great deal about some incredible things about the Gospel. But we're going to start backwards. And so we're going to back up to those who were the furthest from Jesus in the story and those who met him last. And then as we progress through the weeks, we'll get closer and closer to those who were closest to Jesus and knew him the most. And so as we do that, that takes us to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew tells the Christmas story in a really different way than Luke does. Luke has our traditional story that has the scene of the nativity. And Matthew really omits the nativity. In fact, he actually omits the birth of Jesus. He talks about one character that we'll look at in a couple of weeks before the birth of Jesus. And then he brings us in our attention to a group of characters that met Jesus sometime after his birth. We know them as the wise men. Who are these guys? I want you to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 2 and look at verse 1 and just want to look at the story of the wise men and draw some things that are really significant through these insignificant, these unlikely characters that were brought on scene at the arrival of Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and we've come to worship him. 
That's just about all we know about the wise men. Now, there are songs that we have about we three kings, and there are figurines that we have in our nativity sets. And I hate to burst it to you, break your bubble here, but none of that really happened that way. These men, it says, were from the east. We don't really know where that would have been. Likely it was from some Arab country. It's likely that they could have been Persian or they could have been from Babylonia. They weren't from the far, far east, and they weren't necessarily Asian, but they were from the east. We don't know how many of them there were actually either. It doesn't name it in the Bible. We say three because it really looks good in our nativity set and because they gave three gifts. But we don't know. We know that there was more than one because it's plural, but likely there were probably dozens of them that traveled. It says wise men in our English text, but the word is actually magi, which is where we get our word magicians. We also don't really know what these guys did. We don't know much about their background and and, and what that meant to be wise men or magi. The magi were a unique group of people and throughout history, magi were described, the word magi describes several different groups of people. We see it in the Old Testament. Daniel led a group of men that were known as the Magi. We see that in his book. We, we see Simon the Magician or Simon the Magi in the book of Acts. It was a role that played. Some of them were sorcerers and some of them were magicians. But more than likely, this group was from a group of men, an Arab, or Persian, or Babylonian group of men that were the smartest people in their land. They were kind of a fraternity that kings and leaders would rely upon because of their intellect and their intelligence. They were well-read men, they were well-studied men, and they were versatile in the fields that they knew a great deal about. And so they, they read a lot, they were historians, they were philosophers. We see in this story that they were involved in astrology and astronomy. They were stargazers. Many of them would have served a role as a prophet. We see some in other places as dream interpreters. They were counsels to the king because of their wisdom. They were smart guys. They were incredibly influential and they were wealthy. When a king wanted to know something, when he needed wisdom, the magi would be brought in. He would tell them the issue and they would weigh in on it, foreseeing and explaining things from their perspective, a really group of wise men. Well, in their, in their activities and what they were doing, one of the things that they did is they, they watched the stars and they, they told things from the stars. And likely they were from an area that was polytheistic. And so they, they, they looked at some of the stars as representatives of gods and would have worshipped those things. And then one day, all of a sudden, they noticed a different star. A star they hadn't seen before. And so these men, these really smart men, begin to try to figure out what is this star and why has this star appeared? And we don't know how they arrived at it, but somehow the conclusion of their study, the conclusion of this journey that they went on to try to figure out why this star has just appeared led them to the conclusion that a king has been born to Israel. It's likely that that conclusion came from some texts or some knowledge that they had of the Old Testament found in Numbers 24, verse 17, in Balaam's oracle, when he said, A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. As they began to decipher and try to figure out what it was, they concluded that this is that star. And this star indicates that that prophet Balaam what he dreamed and what he saw, what he proclaimed has now come true. And so they make a decision. Well, let's go to Jerusalem and let's worship this king. Likely that's what these men would have also done. Many from Arab countries, when another king or a prince was born in another country, they would visit that king, pay homage, give gifts and so forth. These men take it a step further when they say that we come to worship this king. They wanna give their allegiance to this God, this king and recognize him. And so they, they set out on a journey. Now, when we think of this journey, and in our minds of what the nativity scene is like, we see these men kind of arriving somewhere in, in the night of Jesus' birth. So you have the shepherds that come in, and then you have this massive entourage with these kings. But likely that's not 
what happened. We know the star appeared around the time of Jesus' birth, and so these men had a, a long ways to go. They had to take the time to figure out what was going on and conclude that it was in Jerusalem and there was a king being born. And then they had to take the time to journey. And this journey would have taken days, weeks, possibly months, if not even more than that. They were thousands of miles away from where the family of Jesus was at this time. And so they set out. This wasn't an overnight trip. This wasn't something they could get on a bus or a plane. This was something that they had to prepare for. Off across some rough terrain, some dangerous places, crossing some dangerous people to come and meet this king. They're certain of their conclusion, though, that this is a king that's been born in Israel. That's what they declare. Hey, we're here and we're trying to find, in verse 2, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? That's the conclusion they've come to that they're certain of. It wasn't something that we think there might have been. No, these men set out to meet this king. They, they spent the money, spent the time, spent the energy because they were certain a king was born. But that certainty was a surprise to the very people the king was born to. And so they come to Jerusalem. Why do they go to Jerusalem? Because they assume he's a king capital city of Israel, this is where he would be. So they come, hey, where is he? We've seen the star. I'm sure you guys know about the star we're talking about. Can you take us to him? We'd like to meet him. And in verse 3, the people are confused. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where, where is this Christ figure to be born? What, is, what are these men talking about? And so we have a new character that's introduced. So these men come to Jerusalem. It's likely they just began to ask people, where's the king? Where's the king? Where's the king? Well, that word circles around to Herod. Herod was the king. He actually had the title of king, and he had been king for about 35 years. This is Herod the Great. He was a great ruler, and he led the nation to a lot of peace and stability under his reign. But he wasn't really that great of a guy. He was a tyrant. He was a ruthless man. From the very beginning of his reign and rule 35 years ago, he began killing people one by one if they showed opposition to him or if he felt like they were a threat to his throne. He wanted to establish himself, and he established himself by his ruthlessness, by his power. He literally had a thumb on the people. He had killed other priests. He had pushed out Pharisees and Sadducees from their role. And Herod was the man, a mean, mean man. And so when he hears there's a king, it absolutely troubled him. No, sir. I'm the king. And if there's going to be another king, it's going to be my decision. Who are these people saying there's a king? I need to figure this out. It troubled him. It troubled him because 35 years he'd been king. He's older. He's coming to the end of his reign. And he didn't want to end on this note with the throne being taken by someone else. And so it troubles him. And it says in verse 3 that it also troubles Jerusalem as well. And of course it troubled Jerusalem because even though Herod was rough under Herod, Jerusalem had found stability, and the people of Jerusalem were doing pretty well. Life was good, life was at peace, and as long as they stayed in step, took care of Herod and did what he said to do, everything was fine. It was a peaceful time for the nation of Israel, and specifically the city where the king resided in Jerusalem. So they were troubled. Well, all of a sudden now, we know what Herod's capable of. We're bothered by this because if Herod gets upset, our lives are messed up. Disruption, confusion, and change. That's what this king does. He's only an infant, at the oldest, maybe a toddler. And already, because of his presence, there is a disruption of life. There is a confusion. Things change 
and he demands that things change. And so an investigation begins, and he calls in the chief priests in verse 4, and assuming chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired where the Christ was born. He brings these guys in. These chief priests and scribes were corrupt. They were political and religious leaders, men that were in the back pocket of Herod. They were men that this baby, as he grew up, would deal with on a regular basis. They were the very men that brought Jesus all the way to the cross. They knew the prophecy. In fact, when Herod asked them, the, 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 they, they answered very quickly. It's something they were very aware of. Look at verse 5. They, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, that's where this child's going to be born. For it's written by the prophets. It's like they knew it. It's one of their memory verses in Awana. And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judea, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah. But from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod. We don't know what these guys are talking about, but we do know when there is a king, when there is a Messiah, yes, that is part of our prophecy and something that we're believed, that there is one to come, a Messiah to come. And, but we know this, when he comes, it's going to happen in the city of Bethlehem. Now, whether these men knew exactly why Herod was asking or not, they give an honest answer, an answer that they knew, an answer that rolled off their tongues that they were very aware of. They knew the prophecy. They knew one day a king was coming, but they didn't know what the wise men knew. These scribes and these chief priests and Herod himself were closer to all the information that these wise men were seeking. They knew the facts. They knew the scripture. They knew the prophecies. They knew everything they were supposed to know about what was going to happen, but they did not know what it was happening five miles away from where they were. It was men thousands of miles away that though they knew less, knew so much more. Is it interesting here that we see those nearest to the means were furthest from the end? And it troubles Herod, so he begins to devise a plot. Notice verse 7, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So he gets the information about Bethlehem. He goes to these wise men. Okay, so guys, tell me a little bit about this star. So I... I'm picking up that this child's probably in Bethlehem. But when did this star appear? And it's likely Herod's asking this question because he wants to know how developed all this is, how old this child is, how long this child's been around, and so what sort of action he needs to take. But he deceives it by what he says next, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, I tell you what, go and search for the child. And when you found him, if you give me some information, if you bring me word, that I too may come and I, I want to worship him just like you guys. Now, that seems actually pretty nice. But we see later that wasn't Herod's intention at all. This was a scheme that Herod was planning and playing. These men didn't know Herod. Everybody else in Israel would have known what Herod's intentions were when he said, I tell you what, go find out more. They would have known that, ooh, Herod is after somebody. But not these men. They go innocently. Okay, Herod. We'll bring you back word. Thanks for telling us where to go. We'll look for the child and we'll tell you what we find out so that you too, just like us, you've been right here this whole time, you didn't even know it. We'll come back and, and we'll tell you all about it. But Herod's plan was, was not that. His plan was to hunt this child down. In fact, we see in verse 12 that these wise men were being warned. They were warned in a dream not to return to Herod and departed to their own country by another way. But that didn't stop Herod. He never got word. All he knew was a timeline that somewhere two years ago, this star appeared. It appeared in Bethlehem. And so in verse 16, Herod shows the prideful, arrogant, wicked, and vile intentions behind it. He can't find the family he doesn't know who the child is, so he makes a decision. Every firstborn child under the age of two in the city of Bethlehem is done. Slaughter them now. And every child 
firstborn under the age of two is killed. Out of Herod's anger and rage, a holocaust happens as a result. But these men were not part of that. In verse 9, after listening to the king, it tells us this, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, this is interesting. They, they had seen this star a long ways away. It's likely that this star that they saw was just shining. It's a star that they found in, in, in the Western Hemisphere, and so they're going to follow it to where they concluded it was lying over the city of Jerusalem. But here in this verse, the star all, the, all of a sudden becomes a GPS. The star before was just simply a sign. But now, as they go to Jerusalem, the star guides them to what they're seeking in this. It's a GPS for them. This is really interesting. The star is moving. The star is shining. The star is working. What kind of, what kind of star is this? Well, this is a this is divine star. And we see that the star led them, tells us in verse 9, to the place where the child was. And in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with joy. Think about that. What started as a question, months, years, thousands of miles before this, now has an answer. The questions that they were asking, why this star? What does it mean? Here, they're standing before the answer. What a truth. And the answer is not just some sort of textbook. And the answer is not just some sort of conclusion. The answer is found in the flesh and blood of an infant, a person. What a truth. Your questions, when you really seek them, and when you really strive to find the answer, and you honestly seek the answers to all the hardest and deepest questions of life, they too find their answer in flesh and blood in the same person. You can get there from where you are. So oftentimes we come to questions in life and these big questions and our conclusion is, well, there must not be a God and Jesus must be false. But no, 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 that's not the truth. The truth is the very questions when we dig and we pursue and we seek lead us right to Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to develop. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I don't know what sort of star you're following, but I want to tell you this. The answer is Jesus. And if your journey to God doesn't lead you to the feet of Jesus just like it did for these intelligent, wise, learned men, then somewhere along the way you have taken a detour. Amen. And so these men find themselves in this scene, this family's home. We don't know what sort of home it was. I would assume they weren't in, in the barn and he wasn't sleeping in the manger anymore. Hopefully Joseph had, had manned up and got him a house. Or a cave or something like that. And so it tells us they were going into the house and saw the child with Mary and his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. That's the scene that we think of. 
They bow down after seeking him out. They worship. And they present their gifts. These men respond the way one should to a king. We know that they're wealthy men because they give some really expensive gifts. They give gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's been a lot read and there's a lot thought about the significance of this gift. I think the best conclusion of it is that these were gifts from where they were. These were expensive gifts. These were kingly gifts. These were significant gifts. And and I think that these gifts likely funded the family moving on. They had a lot of journey that they had to do after this story closes. A lot of things that they had to do. And Joseph and Mary were a young couple, very poor. God was funding what he was having them do through the gifts of these men. But I do think it's significant that there is some meaning behind the gifts. We think of gold as the gift of a king. Frankincense, we see elsewhere in the Bible that it was something that was used in temple worship and particularly sacrifice. So while gold is a sign of this king, uh, frankincense would have been a sign of this child's deity, that he is God. And so they're presenting to him the same thing that priests for centuries have presented to God. And then finally, myrrh. Myrrh was used for many different things, but one of the specific things and something that is used later in Jesus' life, or rather his death, is that myrrh was used for embalming, a sign of his humanity. So we have here in these pictures a sign of a king, a sign of a, a god, but yet also a sign of a man. And isn't that what Jesus really is? It's a strange story that these Eastern, likely Arab, bright, wealthy leaders travel thousands of miles to worship the baby of a poor Jewish family. And nobody knows why. Nobody understands. It doesn't make sense to anyone what's taking place. And we don't see anyone else joining these men from far, far away to participate in the worship of what they say and conclude is a king. A strange story, really unlikely characters. There's two things I want to draw out to you, two important words I think are significant as we look at this story. And the first one is this, proximity. What jumps off the page as we look at these different characters is is the proximity to Jesus. The most learned people The most wise people in Jewish land, the people that understood the scriptures and understood the Old Testament and understood the prophecies, lived five miles from Jesus, who was to be their king, but they had no clue. Their proximity was very close, but yet these people who know nothing and live thousands of miles away knew it. These priests and scribes and Herod, they had the Bible, they had the facts, they had the knowledge, they had the temple, they had it all. They had had it all from birth and from centuries before, but they didn't know. Yet these pagan, polytheistic people had no clue what these other men knew, but they knew him. Those nearest to the means were the farthest from the ends. And those at the ends were nearest to salvation. What this baby shows us is proximity doesn't matter. How often does the lost and dying world as this same savior reaches and to their far distance from God, see the hand of God move amongst them. But we who know the facts 
have the scriptures, have the traditions, have been around this all our life, miss it. So many of us are so bound by our traditions and our expectations and our selfishness and our materialism and our comfort that we missed the movement of the hand of God. While those who have no access see it. Proximity matters not to him. In fact, Jesus was known as he grew up to reach people that were far. He spent most of his time with people that were really, really far from God. We hear the story of the prodigal son who at his furthest point found the mercy of the father. We see Jesus assisting and caring for and teaching an adulterous woman who's about to be stoned to death. We see Jesus spending time with a woman at the well. And we see Jesus time after time, page after page, reaching into people's life who were at their lowest point of blindness or paralysis or sickness. Which tells us this. There is as much, if not more, to know of Jesus in the valleys and the highways and hedges of life than even in the mountaintop of life or the temple or the church. It doesn't matter how far you are. That's where Jesus goes. That's where the gospel goes. Far. Here we see in this this star appearing and causing questions and these men beginning to seek out the answers to the questions that lead them all the way to Jesus is we see one of God's motives and one of God's works that begins here and continues even now. He wants to reach everyone. He wants to reach people far, far away. And from the very beginning, he showed us that heart that people who are far, people who have no access, people who are unreached matters to God. Matthew begins his gospel with the story of God sending his son to the far nations by reaching these wise men. And uniquely, Matthew ends the story by the son sending the church to the nations. In Matthew 28, when he says, go. This is why missions matters. Because from day one, it mattered to God. And it ought to matter to you and I. It ought to matter to you that there are people who have never heard for generations in their family, have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. It ought to matter that there are people in this world whose language does not have the Bible, the Bible that you have 10 to 15 copies of in your home. They don't have a family Bible. They don't have any Bible. That matters to God, and it ought to matter to God's people because proximity matters not to him. There's another word, however, I want you to see and I want you to notice very closely that we see contrasted in this story. We see the proximity of these wise men far away from God, yet closer. We see the proximity of these scribes and chiefs and Herod very close but very far away. There's another thing that is stark is their response. We have two responses here. Two people who arrive at the same information are given the same facts, no matter how they came about them, but yet two different responses. One is response of worship, and the other is a response of rejection. 
we see an arrogant king with all the knowledge and all the answers who could have ushered this king to his throne. Herod could have ended really, really well with God and could have welcomed Jesus and said, you know what, I'm going to finish, I'm going to get right, and I'm going to respond to the presence of this king by giving him the throne and setting him up for success and moving forward. But instead, he refused to give up his throne. You must understand something about this child that was born. He is a king. And because he is a king, he demands the throne. The throne is his, and he will have it. And he wants the throne of your life. He wants it all. He came not just to be a part of your life, not to be just a place and a nativity set on your mantle. He came to disrupt your world. He came to take over and bring his rule and his reign to your life. And that's a really good thing. Yet many, many of us, like Herod, will say to this king, just like Herod, my terms, my way, or they'll ignore the king. And friends, to ignore him is to reject him as much as it is to oppose him like Herod. There are many really good, good-hearted, hard-working, good people, good Americans who are no different than Herod. And some of you to this point, to this moment, to this minute, to this second of your life have been Herod all along. And while you haven't done anything as, as vile as Herod did, you're the Herod that we see in verses 1 through 12 refusing to accept and surrender to the reign of the king of kings in your life. Rejection. Yet we also have men who had no business, no access, no knowledge. They had never been to church. They didn't know any of the books of the Bible. They had been part of a nation that wasn't one of these God bless American nations. They had been part of a nation that had been, been against God's plan for centuries. And yet from their far place, they find the king and their response is to come, to bow down and worship. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. How these eastern Arabs responded and how this western king responds are really the only two responses that you can give to this king. There is no middle ground. You will either surrender your life and worship him, or you reject him. You may humble yourselves before him, or he will humble you before himself. The king has come. And I don't know where you are, and I don't know how far you are, or how close you are, but he has come to you. Whether you are near and around the church and have been around the truth all your life, or whether you are as far as you could possibly be in your life, just as the prophecy says, this shepherd has come for his people. And this morning, you can be his people if you'll bow down to him. Let's pray.